the love for retro computing it's not really about nostalgia it's about connecting with other nerds that are a generation or two out from you and feeling the love that they felt for their machines i've got something pretty special today i've got a commodore 64 but you don't have to have a commodore 64 i mean look at this this keyboard's kind of gross it's sort of yellow you don't have to have one of these to experience the the joy and the love that somebody's put into this i'm going to share with you a uh, sort of a restoration archival project that I'm working on, but you can go play these right now at the Internet Archive. Now, in case you're not familiar, one of the big things the Internet Archive does <laughs> is preservation. And, oh boy, this machine is from like 1984, 1983, 84, 85, somewhere through there. And the Commodore 64 was a pretty popular machine because it was inexpensive. Now, I mean, to be sure, IBM was starting to take over with x86 in the early 1980s. And that's a little before my time. I'm sort of reaching into the past. Um, but I did get to play with one of these growing up because, you know, you could get them at flea markets by then for like five or $10. And, you know, it was sort of fun to figure out what secrets it has. It was like a, an electronic puzzle, basically. And the Commodore 64 was pretty popular for different kinds of games. Well, things that you might not recognize as games today if you're not, you know, from that far back. But to be sure, machines that people loved a lot. And preservation, because these things were so old and certain things were not insanely popular. So the discs are so old, it's hard to read them. Preservation sort of becomes important. Let somebody else feel the love that you felt for whatever it is that you've set up. And it bleeds through not just in the discs and the software, but other stuff as well. So this is just a, this is a little bit of an archive project that I'm working on. And um, this stuff wasn't, wasn't my stuff or, uh, or anybody that I knew. Uh, it's sort of a friend of a friend kind of thing. But this is the Commodore 64 and it had the 1541 five and a quarter inch disc drive. These are five and a quarter inch discs, you know, floppy discs, it, it really is you know, floppy. But these discs are from the very early 80s. Nothing here is from uh, more recently than say 1985. I think 19, late 1985. So these discs are fabulously old. They're magnetic. They're very sensitive to magnetic fields. And if you've got a magnet anywhere close to them, uh, they're never going to be read. They're going to be broken forever. It's getting very difficult to find devices that are capable of reading these discs. And so this one is the Commodore VIC 1541 test demo, 48 tracks per inch single-sided thing, because these are so old that there's only, you can only afford one read write head that was on the bottom. And so you would put the disc in and it would read from the bottom. And then when you want to read the other side, you would literally flip over the disc yourself. Now IBM, because you know, international business machines, those x86 floppy drives could read and write from both sides because they could afford both <laughs> the read and write heads but those machines were like mm, five grand so uh, at least for one that was reasonably equipped this was an order of magnitude less expensive by the mid to late 80s you know you might be spending five hundred dollars seven hundred dollars um which is a much much more palatable than 10 times as much we've got the the two-in-one commodore 64 slash 128 program two big mac program one excalibur it's nice a lot of this you can already find on the internet archive what, what you might not find in the Internet Archive is you start to find little treasures, things that people have put together. And you can sort of, you know, play the role of archaeologist and sort of figure that out. So I noticed some things when we're looking at this disc. One, um, someone has like, like a chipmunk has nibbled out a corner of this disc. And that's because this disc wasn't, you know, it's a, it's a double-sided disc. Or No, actually it says single-sided double density. So Maxell did not validate this disc to even be a double-sided disc. It just so happened that you could use those as a, uh, a double-sided uh, disc, and that worked okay. So this notch meant that it was a uh, uh, read-write. So you could read and write to this disc. If you put a piece of tape over this notch, um, it would become read-only. And so if you flip the disc over without this notch here, you wouldn't be able to write to the other side. So you could literally just notch it out. They made special tools where you could, you know, notch out a corner and do stuff. This one is Bruce Lee, Jumpman Jr., Grid Runner, and Talladega. 
dash racing game because nobody knew what Talladega was in those in those days. And then on the back, someone has put a label, Summer Games. Load, uh, I suppose that's supposed to be a dollar sign, comma, eight, comma, one, eight being the, the uh, floppy drive device number. Uh, you can also load and store information on cassette tapes. So if you had a reasonably okay cassette tape player, you could literally store and load programs from a cassette tape. Now, IBM had that too in the IBM PC Junior, um, but it was a little bit of a rare accessory. Like nobody actually bothered with that because tapes for doing that kind of thing were really awful. And then there's a bunch of these discs that says ISCLIN contract TAC, uh, task report 1985, number one. There's like 10 of these. So this was probably some sort of business keeping thing. I'm gonna try to get a look at these and uh, if it's not, you know, like some private business contract or something, I'm gonna upload all of this to the to the Internet Archive. Some of this they already have, but but a fair bit of it they don't. I mean, look, it's a it's a Brother Bun. You know, the people who did Carbon San Diego, it's right there. Um, my favorite Commodore 64 game ever was Maniac Mansion. That didn't come out until 1987, but you can look up some demos and videos of Maniac Mansion. And then later there was Day of the Tentacle for DOS, and you could play the original Maniac Mansion in a simulated Commodore 64 in Maniac Mansion 2, Day of the Tentacle. So it's a lot of fun. Articles A2. This is a piece of newsprint that someone had saved with their floppy disks. It says, how to get in touch. Here's a list of computer bulletin boards and systems that are nearby. And so it's a nice little table of bulletin board systems that are nearby. This is a bulletin board system was what you did before the internet. You know, one computer could call another computer and these could use a modem to connect to uh, another device, you know, a 300 baud modem, an ancient telephone. Well, at the risk of going a little off track. Oh, that's a satisfying sound. Imagine it was always really satisfying if you had to bludgeon somebody, you just grab one of these. Ah! So this is a telephone. It used to make calls to people on this. This was a thing. I gotta be a little bit careful with this because it's got magnets in it. I don't want to get it too near the discs. But it wasn't really useful for the computer. First, there was this. This is a modem. But this is the type of modem called an acoustic coupler. This would plug into the Commodore or, you know, IBM, any computer. And you would have a connection like that. The computer would talk to another computer through a setup like this. And so the computer would make noises and listen for noises from the other computer. And it literally is called an acoustic coupler because it acoustically couples. Now, this is one of the transitionary modems. There's a thing in the back here where you could plug it directly into the, into the, the, the phone line. You didn't really need to do the acoustic coupler. But you see, you gotta understand, AT&T was insane. For the longest time, that you only were allowed to plug in AT&T stuff. So in certain parts of the United States, it was illegal to plug in this General Electric uh, thing. You could be fined, you could have your phone service taken away into an AT&T telephone line, at least until you know there were some lawsuits and some investigations and then ultimately AT&T was broken up. But this General Electric would let you use an acoustic coupler in case you were in an area that required you know, a, uh, an original AT&T Ma Bell telephone, which is what this is, and this handset is made to the AT&T specification. Like this is what pay phones were, this is you know, pretty much what everything was. And uh, you would acoustically couple that and then the computers could talk to other computers, you could download new programs. It was like the internet, but it wasn't really the internet because you could only talk to one other computer at a time and you had to call it on a phone line. So imagine, <laughs> imagine paying per minute, depending on what website you're on, and uh, you know, per byte and per everything else. And that's where we would be if the phone companies were in charge, because that's how it was at one point. Beachhead, saucer attack, bzone.load. Oh, and on the back, we've got impossible mission, up and down, and spy hunter. Spy hunter, these people knew what was up. So what does a restoration actually look like? What you really need is a good solid working floppy drive, or tape drive as the case may be, but we're working with floppies today. So this one is an ALPS mechanism and it's in pretty decent shape. And again, like I say, don't plug one of these into the wall for the uninitiated. It's uh, potentially pretty dangerous. 
You can see I've replaced all the electrolytic caps here and some of these ceramic capacitors, the, the tantalum, uh, as they age, they have a tendency to want to short out. This is one of the smallest PCB versions of the Commodore disk drive. The, the PCB is absurdly tiny by uh, Commodore uh, floppy drive standards. Sometimes they come all the way out to here. What most people don't realize is that the Commodore floppy drive is a computer in and of itself. It's a 6502. Okay, everybody knows that, that works on you know, Commodore disk drives. And then I've got this, <laughs> the CESP K64 XUM 1541. I don't know why on the front of the drive, the one in the front of the 1541 looks completely different than the one in the back of the 1541. There's probably some hilarious story to that. Anyway, you plug this in USB first. If you plug this into the drive first without plugging in USB, this goes into flash mode. You can actually flash the firmware on here. There's an Atmel microcontroller in there. Uh, Atmel shows up in a lot of places. Atmel is the microprocessor most of the Arduinos are based on, and um, they're really handy for gluing together fabulously ancient technology and modern technology, as evidenced by something like this. There are even projects that are tangential to and quasi supported by the Internet Archive to be able to like turbo read Apple II discs and that kind of thing. And it's kind of, if I had more time, I would be super into that. I'm using a program called CBM Transfer. I've got this all plugged in. I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the floppy drive. And then I'm running the CBM Transfer software on the thing. And I'm gonna say, hey, can you see the floppy drive? Oh, I think it can, it says okay. Then we're gonna hit the directory button. And it's able to read the directory. This one's got Hangman and a whole bunch of other stuff. But again, you know, in the preservation story, the preservation story is somebody took the time to print out what was on the disk and how much free space there was and they would write in things. They even wrote in how many blocks the program took. This is obviously someone that cared very much about their Commodore 64. Uh, at this point, like you don't try to run the stuff from the floppy and I, I mean, it's kind of authentic experience. We just want to image the whole thing. So I can hit the green arrow and it'll say, oh, no file select. Do you want to make an image of the whole thing? Yes, and this game, uh, this disc is called Games To Be. So I'm gonna just say that and say, hey, let's make a copy of that. And then it'll go through and image the disc. One of the things that goes with preservation, if you're gonna do this, if you see, you know, the mother load at a yard sale somewhere, as I have, um, you wanna probably grab this and grab a picture of it and put that with your archive as well. Because it's not just the stuff that's on the image, it's also the stuff that's you know, people have done the little scribbles. Take a picture of it and include it with the upload because, hey, it's pretty awesome. So here, here we have our modern core i7 with our USB adapter cable through an Atmel that someone has lovingly hand programmed that you can pick these up for like 10 or $15. And, you know, the last time this disc was used was probably 30, 35 years ago, pushing 40 years ago. I mean, it's dated. It says 19th of April, 1984 was when this this printout was made. And since then, at least one thing was added to it, but probably not 10 years after the fact, so. Oh boy, it's done. At this point, you can use it with a Commodore 64 emulator like Vice. And that's also a thing that you can do with this. You don't even need any of this. You can just go to the Internet Archive and play this stuff directly in your browser or download Vice and floppy images and, you know, see what life was like in 1984. I've got all these and about 100 more to go. And, you know, a lot of these discs, like this one, something very bad happened to this one. I don't think I'm going to be able to read that. Not without, uh, you know, some more stuff. Does the Internet Archive have the Commodore 64 version of the Mask of the Sun? I'm pretty sure they do. They definitely have the Apple II version. But who knows? Who knows what else is lurking on here? There's, uh, you know, we got the Bet Back and the Bet Data stuff and Print Direct, so who knows? I'm Wendell, this is level one. This has been a, a look at the Commodore 64 and some of the stuff that's, you know, going on with the Commodore 64. This is kind of a different video for me. I just wanted to share because anytime you run across something where somebody has had a hobby and put a lot of love into it, you can look at that and you can appreciate it. It's, I like it. I'm Wendell, this is level one. If you want to share your nostalgia or maybe you're just a hoarder, either way, post on the forums at level one text. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out and I'll see you there.